Good evening. My name is Jeff Eggers, and I research the intersection of organizational performance and behavioral science. And the idea I want to float with you tonight is the idea of putting behavioral scientists in the White House Situation Room. And I know something about this room, the Situation Room, only because I worked at the White House for a number of years. And I can tell you it is a marvel of high technology. And the tool that gets brought into the Situation Room most often, the tool that gets used the most, is the human brain. <laughs> and while the human brain is also marvelous, it's not exactly high tech. And my contention is that the human brain is not at all optimized for decisions in the White House Situation Room. That's because it didn't evolve for handling the Situation Room, right? It evolved for this. <laughs> the human brain evolved at a time when our hunter-gatherer ancestors were fending off saber-toothed tigers, right? It is not optimized for the time we live in. By now, most of us have heard of System one and system two thinking, the two functions of the brain, popularized by this gentleman, Daniel Kahneman, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And system one is system one for a reason, right? It's automatic. It happens without us even realizing it's happening. It's what controls our breathing. It's what allows us to do public speaking or fend off saber-toothed tigers. And because it's fast, right, it also helps and enables our intuition. So I'll give you an example, a quick quiz. A uh, famous question, if the ball and the bat together cost a dollar and 10 cents, and I tell you the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, how much does the bat cost? Intuition, most often people come to a dollar, and your intuition would be wrong, it's actually a dollar and five cents. Our brain uses a number of shortcuts, or heuristics, and that's how intuition becomes very quick. But by virtue of making these shortcuts, it also results in a number of errors or cognitive biases. And this is one of the things I saw very frequently in the Situation Room. I worked on Afghanistan in my last assignment at the White House, and I was often struck that you could have the Department of Defense come and present a very different picture of the war in Afghanistan and the intelligence community. It was almost as if they were talking about two different wars. And there's a, there's a theory in behavioral science that people that are charged with executing something typically are not the best judge at how that thing is going. Right? And they typically overstate how well they think it's going. We call it grading our own homework. Behavioral scientists call it optimism bias. But in either case, it shouldn't surprise you that the Defense Department would often say the war was going quite well and the intelligence community would have a very different view. So I've been asking the question, how can we improve decision making in the Situation Room? How can we reduce cognitive bias in national security decision making? I've been looking at three main ideas. One, giving policymakers better training two, leveraging data in the process of making decisions, and three, changing the, the structure and the process of making decisions itself. And let me go through these uh, three options very quickly. Training is great, uh, training helps, but training is largely ineffective, unfortunately. One of the problems with behavioral science is it's like behavioral, right? It's really hard to rewire the brain. And lots of studies have shown that even highly educated, well-trained experts are no less prone to cognitive bias than the rest of us. So training has its limitations. Data. Data is the long-term solution. There's no doubt about that. The problem with data is that we don't today have an agreed upon foundation in data for making decisions, right? We agree on things like how many seconds are in a minute or what time the sun's gonna come up tomorrow, but we don't agree on a lot of other things like poverty or education or climate or the war in Afghanistan in my case. So data is always going to be a long-term solution. And it's even worse is we ignore data. Like even when we have it, we don't use it. And there's lots of, of studies of this. Uh, Paul Slovic, a researcher at the University of Oregon, likes to say, people are more inclined to listen to a story about one person than they are data of 1,000 people. Right? Policy makers are more likely to approve resources to save one known life than to save 1,000 unknown lives. And that's system one emotional thinking and it generally doesn't result in good policy. So that brings me to the third option, and that's the structural option, right? And this is just a schematic of the National Security Council. We typically have functional policy offices overlaid with regional policy offices, and then supporting elements like legal affairs, congressional affairs, public affairs, that kind of thing. And to make a decision, you usually take a regional policy office, overlay it with a functional policy office, and they kind of come up with the options and vote and then you support it with these, these offices at the bottom. Like, the lawyers are always there. <laughs> lawyers are in every meeting and they review every memo because you want to know the legal contours of every decision, right? You want to be advised on the legal consequences and parameters of your decision. So in a similar way, 
you could put an office of behavioral science or cognitive science into the array of supporting offices at the bottom. And just like the lawyers, being, they would be in every meeting, they would review every memo, but instead of looking at legal issues, they would look at things and say, whether you had untested assumptions or whether you had made jumps in your logical argument that were faulted, in effect, you would institutionalize the role of the devil's advocate. And you would institutionalize it and make it structural. Last year, the president approved an executive order on implementing behavioral science in government. And it mostly goes to program implementation, redesigning websites and forms to get better participation and things like thrift saving plans and that kind of stuff. It's been called nudging, and it really goes to improving the implementation of government programs. What I'm talking about, what I call behavioral policy, goes much further. And it's much further upstream than program implementation. It's fine that the government wants to nudge the people to participate in government programs, but I think it's much more important that the government nudge itself to make better decisions. And so my call to action is simply to have a conversation with the next administration about going further and putting behavioral scientists in the situation room. Thanks.